Okay, open your Bibles, if you would, to the great book of Revelation, chapter 4. Revelation, chapter 4. And Revelation, chapter 4, verse 1 reads, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, and which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. I mean, I'm going to show you some future. All of you like to know what the future brings. Now, just, just thumb back, if you would, to chapter 1. Hold your place there now. Chapter 1, verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, that's the first day of the millennium, and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it into the seven churches. And you notice then, of course, this being the Lord, and you notice in, um, in verse 16, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Okay. You want to make a mental note of that two-edged sword. But this was the Lord, and this was Christ also. Now, what, what has he just done right prior to this fourth chapter? He's gone to all seven of the churches, which he was instructed to do in that first chapter. And he let all of them but two know he was very disappointed in them. Okay. But those two that still taught who the Kenites were, he was very proud of. And he said, you can open doors that nobody can close and close doors that nobody can open because you have that key of David. But the important point I want you to know, we seem to in these end times, people have a fear you don't seem to realize God's on the throne. Okay. Well, what, what's a throne for? A throne is for judgment. It's to observe what's going on down here. And he's not a part-time father. Okay. He's on that throne seven days a week, a full 360 or five days a year, whichever it happens to be. He's always there. So you have nothing to worry about because he's always with you. He knows you. He leads you. He observes. He, he knows what you even think, not only what you say. So always know that. He's on the throne. Verse 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit and behold a throne, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. I, w I want you to go back to Psalms 103 for me. Psalms 103. Pick it up in verse 19. Psalms 103, verse 19. The fact that he is on that throne doing what? We're going to find out what he's doing there. I want to encourage you. I want you to know that he's looking out for you. Verse 19, the Lord prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Not part, my friend. Not just part time. But he is ruler over all, all the time. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearken unto the voice of his word. I don't know, do you do his commandments? That, that's what he wants to know. Do you listen to him? Or do you like to listen to gobbledygook? Okay. Ratchet jaw. You want to listen to him. He's not sitting on that throne for naught. Okay. 
He's there for a reason. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts. That means the host of angels. You ministers of his. That means right here on earth, the ministers that uh, do his pleasure. I don't know. Do you give him pleasure? The way you give him pleasure is if someone needs a word of truth taught to them, you share it. You give them that word of truth. It picks them up. And boy, does it please our Father. He's not, he knows he's not up there by himself, just hoping somebody will pay attention, keeping score, testing, evaluating, observing. He's there for a reason, and it's to look out for those that love him and that give him pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. That's quite a bit of repetition, but you do want to bless him. That's what, that's what gives you points with him, if it's real. Don't ever try to con him. Okay. You're going nowhere that way. Let's go right on into verse, the 104th Psalm. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Not one stitch of, of uh, filthiness about him. Who covers thyself with light, as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. I want you to think of that power for a moment when you look up at the sky. That's your father that did that. Do you wonder if he can't help you? Do you wonder if he can't nudge you along a little bit, kick a bucket out of the way that gets in your path, if, if you're on his mission, if you're pleasing him? Got to be pleasing him first, friend, that comes with it. Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. God is wherever he's, I am that I am. He's wherever he wishes to be. But he's always over his children. He's always on that throne. When he moves, that throne moves with him. That throne means judgment. That throne means control. He's, he's in charge. Who maketh his angel spirits, his ministers, a flaming fire. You know, a minister, a true minister of God brings that fire of truth to the congregation. The fact that our Father loves us. He's above us. He leads us, guides us. And you know something? He needs you. He can get along without you. But he sure likes to be able to depend on you. You know, that's why he has elect. He could count on them in the first earth age. He knows that they can cut it now. If he says go, they're going to go. They're not going to say how far. Well, maybe, maybe after a while. Now, that's the way he likes it. Okay. Who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed for ever, and and so it is. Go with me now to the ninth psalm, way back to number nine. Still thinking about his throne, where he is. Psalms nine. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I'm not going to hold anything back. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I don't know, do you ever share that with anyone? You should. Because he's got so many, many marvelous, marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praises to thy name. O thou most high, Elegon. When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. You can count on it. Your, your enemies don't have a prayer. You might say, well, well, why is that? Well, God gave you power over all your enemies. Do you ever exercise any of it? Well, I wish they'd leave me alone. Well, ask the Father to put them in their place. Do it. Don't just think it or talk about it. Do it. He gives you 
a sword, a two-edged sword. It's his tongue. It's the word of God. If you don't use it, then shame on you. He's on the throne. He's sitting there observing and evaluating. And what are you doing? Well, they're picking on me. Then pick on them back. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou settest in thy, the throne judging right. You want to always make sure you're right. But he'll take care of the rest, okay? When you do your best, I mean, that's not going to be good enough maybe. But don't you ever worry. He'll take up the slack. Okay? He will certainly take up the slack. He'll even the playing field. Hey, you know what? He's on the throne. And he's there for a purpose, not just to look at. Not just so they can say, well, there's God again. He's busy taking care of his children, those that obey his commandments. Thou hast rebuked the heathens, the unbelievers. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. Ultimately, that will happen if they don't come around. O thou enemies, destructions are come to a perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial, that's to say their memory, is perished with them. When, when, when they're gone, they're gone, period. They're blotted out. You won't even remember them. But the Lord shall endure forever. How long? Well, I just wish I could be sure. Forever! He hath prepared his throne for judgment. It's there. That's the purpose of it. Don't you ever get it set in your mind. I just wish God could help me. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's sitting there. He wants to judge. But you've got to ask him. You've got to say, Father, I, I need to talk with you. I want you to see what's happening here. And then... But what you can do, you do yourself. Okay. Because you've heard me, all of you heard me say at one time, well, you hear one of these holy, holy Joes, I'll say. Well, God, I was talking to God and he told me where to park my car today. If you're too stupid to know where to park your car, God's not going to help you. Okay. It's just the way it is. That one-upmanship of trying to say, God really loves me, he told me where to park my car. Well, okay. God doesn't deal with people like that. They just like to talk, okay? You don't want to pay a whole lot of attention to them. Uh, verse 8, is that where we got? And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprighteousness. Listen real carefully, this ninth verse. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed. Where, where do you go when you get in trouble? You run? You hide? Or do you look up? He's your refuge when you're oppressed. When it gets more than you can handle, reach out. Talk to him. Father, help me. A refuge in times of trouble. Verse 10, And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast forsaken them that seek thee. For thou hast not forsaken them that seek thee. You've got to call on him. Well, maybe I'll get around to it. Well, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Okay. If you're too busy to talk to God with your, well, I've got trouble. You don't understand, brother. I've got too much trouble to talk to God. You sure do. You've got more problem than you'll ever be able to get out of. Verse 11. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. And, and so it is. I want, I want to go on to, uh, to the 11th Psalm. Here we go. 11.1. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. Now listen to me. For lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privately or privately shoot. 
at the upright in heart. They're laying out there and waiting. They're setting traps. They like to take advantage of righteous people, rip them off, tear them up, upset them, get their way with them. What are you going to do? You're going to flee? You're going to run? Well, the arrows are getting ready to fly, brother. You, you need to tell me you're a Christian and you don't know who to go to to take care of your little arrows. These are, this is gossip, hurtful words. You don't know who to go to to get that fixed. Hmm? That would be awful if you didn't. Because you have a refuge. He, you know what? He's on the throne. He's waiting. He's not on the throne just to rest a while. He's there for judgment. Well, what, what does that mean exactly? It means to judge for the righteous and take care of the wicked. He's waiting. So don't ever run or hide from little arrows. What do you do? Verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Hashapapa is what that word is in the Hebrew, and it means the foundations is the order of truth. If the order of truth is destroyed, that's awful. That's, uh, what, can, what can the righteous do if the foundations of truth are destroyed? That's the law. It's God's word. Verse 4. The Lord was in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids, listen to me, his eyelids try the children of men. That means his eyes are upon men. He evaluates them. He tests them. He watches you. Now, what are you going to do? You going to run? You going to go hide? Or are you going to call on our Father? I mean, He's your Father too, and He's on the throne and He's waiting. But you got to make your move because that documents that you have faith—faith faith enough to ask. Hey, He's He's in God. I don't want you to forget that verse. He's in his temple, he's on his throne, and his very eyelids are watching you with evaluation to see what you're going to do. Verse 5, the Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. God doesn't like it. Upon the wicked he shall rain sneers, fire and brimstone, and horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. What are you afraid of? How, how stupid it would be to run and hide, even hide from God, when he's your refuge, he's your savior. He's the one you call on. He's on his throne. For the righteousness of, the, for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the bright. The Hebrew in this is, is more beautiful. It reads like this in that last sentence. The upright behold his countenance. The upright behold his countenance because he smiles upon them. Those eyes of evaluation find them worthy. Worthy for a blessing. And he touches them. Raises them up. And he does bring a tempest. That's a storm against the enemy. He will put so many snares in their path that they will trip and they will fall. Okay. And, and, and you know something? We're not just talking. If you truly love your Father and if you communicate with Him, you'd better in these end times. He's there. He's there for you. He loves you. Don't ever, ever forget that. Now, time we return back to the fourth chapter of Revelation. That little old chapter is just loaded.
fourth chapter of Revelation, and we're going to pick up where we left off there. Verse 3. And he that um, sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sword and stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an anvil. First and last stones of the priest's breastplate. Okay. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. That means they had overcome all their problems. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. They had earned them. Okay. In, in my opinion, it's probably the twelve disciples minus one here or there, Judas, and, and the twelve patriarchs, be that as it may. <clears throat> Verse 5, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, these are the seven spirits of God. What? Seven spirits of God. Now, let me tell you something. If you continue on into the fifth chapter, there's a book written and it's got seven seals on it. You've all heard of the seven seals, and most of you know what every one of them means because it's been revealed. But <clears throat> the old boy was crying because nobody could do it. And finally, in the fifth verse of the fifth chapter, turn there with me, chapter 5, verse 5, Revelation. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. You can stop crying. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And, and so it was. Okay. Do you know what the fifth seal is? Let's just stop. No, it was sounds complicated. No, it isn't. The fifth seal is for you to know who a Babdon and a Pagan are. That's to say the Antichrist. And the fact that he will appear for a five-month period. Period. That's all it means. It's that simple. Listen carefully. Six. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. In other words, it's simply the Holy Spirit out to God's election who can pick up the two-edged sword, his truth, and carry it forth to witness against the, seal, the fifth seal's uh, opponent, Satan. Okay. That's simple. So never make God's word complicated. What are they doing besides that? Seven. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of hors d'oeuvres or incense, which are the prayers of the saints. All the prayers that have been, that have been answered in heaven. Okay. I want you to know that the Greek is real strange because where it says the four beasts, it's the living creatures. Okay, it's the zoon or the zoi that God put with the flaming swords at the Garden of Eden to protect the tree of life when He closed Eden. Okay, so don't make any big evil thing out of that because the word beast is used there. Verse nine, and they sang a new song, saying, "Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain." and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And so he has redeemed, made possible, just as this table of the Lord that we partook of this morning. It is the blood of Christ that opens mysteries to some, but the simplicity of God's word to you what is this new song they're singing? We're going to find out. Okay. Verse 10, And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. 
I'm kind of running you around a little bit, but back to Psalms 149. You don't mind, do you? I mean, you're all Bible scholars, actually, and you can cut it. Psalms 149, that's, I believe, next to the last or mighty close to it. One forty nine verse one Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the congregation of saints. I hope that by this time you're beginning to understand that probably the lead line in that new song is praise the Lord. Okay. Well, because of what he's done for us. What he does do for us. If you take advantage of it, if you love him. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Do you give your father pleasure? That's what his blessings flow when you please him. When you find, when you give him pleasure, he's going to run your cup over, my friend. Let the saints, who, well, who are these saints? That means set aside ones. I do that. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Even sleep good at night because they can sing that song. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. I don't want you to forget that. Well, now tell me again, what is that two-edged sword? I purposely took you to the first book of Revela first chapter of Revelation, to show you that it's simply the Word of Christ. It's the Word of God. You can take that Word and you can cut with it. You can take that Word and you can build up, or you can destroy. Well, what do you mean destroy? Well, if, if somebody's trying to destroy your type of ministry, you can ask God to destroy it, to do away with that. Is it righteous? Have you requested a righteous request? Then God will most likely honor it. You have all kinds of power, but you've got to use it. You can't, well, I just wish I had it. You do. You're just not using it. And that's what's important. You have to call on his name and mean it okay. and know it okay. of a certainty. So you want to keep that sharp sword. Well, how do I use that sword? It's real simple. You grow so skilled in God's word that if an adversary shows up to harm God's word, you can take slices like a sharp razor with truth and fillet them out. I've had to do it in a few times. It's necessary sometimes. Well, there's that kind of... No, that's gracious. It saves souls. Okay. That's the way you use the two-edged sword. Do you understand that you're one of Satan's worst enemies? Because you carry that sword? It's the truth. That sword is the truth. Satan hates it. God loves it. And God's on the throne. He's watching, as we learned in that one psalm, his eyelids are evaluating, what are you going to do? I'm going to call on the Lord. Okay. And I need, I'm going to take care of what I can take care of when I, you know, I don't mind. Hey, bring it on. If I can handle it myself, I'm going to do it. Okay. And enjoy it. Okay. But if I need help, I sure know where to go to get it. Okay. I would be foolish not to. He knows everything. I don't. Okay. Um, and uh, I got so carried away with myself, I forgot where I am here. Let me think a moment. To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. That's a little heavy, but the truth, you know, true love corrects people. Do you understand that? If you see somebody on their slippy, on a slippery slope, and you can give them some good, kind, loving advice, sometimes um, 
it, it stings them a little bit, but that's true love, okay? To bind uh, their kings with chains and their nobles with fretters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written, this honor have all his saints, praise ye the Lord. How precious it is that, um, that our Father allows us to do this. I want, I'm going to run you all the way back to Revelation chapter 4. The little thing is just loaded. It is just a beautiful little chapter. And we're going to pick it up with um, verse 6. And before the throne, Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. These, these are living creatures. Don't, don't make something wicked out of them. And the first beast was like a lion. And the second beast like a calf. And a third beast had a face as a man. And a fourth beast like, was like a flying eagle. All of you that have studied with me, you know this was the encampment and the flags of Israel when they camped at night. Okay, Different subject for different time. I'm not going to go there right now. But you're, you're familiar from the first chapter of Ezekiel what that means. And uh, verse 8. Listen carefully. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Do you recognize that from the Lord's Prayer? Okay. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed, holy, be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here is thy kingdom and is to come. In other words, we see them singing that same Lord's Prayer. It's a new song, okay? And yet at the same time, it's an old song. And how precious it is. Because it is the Lord's Prayer. It's the way he told you to pray. Now we go to Psalms 96 again. I'm not going to apologize for running you around a little bit. You're going to be happy about it. <clears throat> Psalms 96. We're going to stay here for a little bit, and you want to pay close attention. Okay. Hallowed be thy name, O Heavenly Father. Thy kingdom come. We're talking about his return. We're talking about the end times. We're talking about now and information you should absorb. <clears throat> Psalms 96. O sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, revered, loved. That word in the Hebrew translates both ways. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. In other words, you've got a lot of religions around this world, but God made it. Okay. So who are you going to serve? Okay. Verse 6. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. 7. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name, bring an offering and come into his courts. What, what offering does he want? We, we studied it this morning. I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your love. He wants you to love him. That's what he wants. That is so hard for some people to understand. They, want, they try to buy themselves their way into heaven. They won't cut it, friends. This is your love for him. 
And that love is enduring. Or worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. Now we're getting close to the beginning of the song. And kind of you get the title of it here. The Lord reigneth. He's on that throne. He hasn't stopped. As some people seem to think. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. In the next verse is a beautiful truth hidden in the Hebrew manuscripts. Okay. And the Mothala locks it in to document the fact that the new song is coming up in the next chapter. In this verse 11, I will translate it for you after I read it in English. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Our father in the Masara, inasmuch as he stated, Eya Asha Eya, I am that I am. I'm whatever I want to be, wherever I want to be. I'm all in all to you. He said in the Masara his sacred name. Not a whole lot of times, but a few times. That 11th verse happens to be one of them, where it states in the 11th verse, um, let the heavens rejoice and the earth be glad. In, in the Hebrew, it is yesh mihu, yesh, which is Y, okay. hash shamayam, which is H, vet hegel, which is B, as in Victor, and Hazel, which Hazel, which is the R, which is H. So it's Y-H-B-H, Yahweh's sacred name, so that you know the song that is coming up is the one he's chosen. Okay. Locked in. You with companion Bibles, you're very fortunate, for the Hebrew is brought out for you in the side column. Verse 12, let the field be fruit joyful, and all that is therein, then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice. Thirteen, before the Lord, for the, he cometh. What's he going to do? For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Now in 97, we have the new song. And he wants you to sing it. So absorb it. Enjoy it. Psalms 98 is, is, is an invitation or a call for all to sing the song. We're going to cover both of them briefly. Verse 97, this is the song. This is the new song. Listen to it. Enjoy it. The Lord reigneth. That's the title. Don't ever think he's off the throne. He's there. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the isles be glad thereof. Clouds. And darkness are around about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Nothing but good. He blots out the bad. A fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about. His lightnings enlighteneth the world. The earth saw and trembled. We've got some days coming that are going to be very interesting. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. He rules the earth, you understand? The heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. Confounded be all they that serve graven images, that boast themselves of idols, worship him, all ye gods. If you want to be confused, have to it. Okay? If, you want, if you want to play church, go ahead. Yeah. And get away from God's word. You're going nowhere. That's what he's saying. Okay. Zion heard and was glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoiced because of thy judgments, O Lord. Why? He's always fair. He's always, well, I'm afraid I'll get a bum deal. No, you won't. That's his promise, and you can count on it. For thou, Lord, art high above all the earth, thou art exalted far above all gods. Why, why would you want to, to let someone lead you into some mystic study 
whereby they don't really use God's word, but they simply allude to it. Why, why would you want to do that? When you, you cut off your own inheritance, you lose everything. Don't ever forget this song, and you stick with it. Ye that love the Lord, hey ye that he preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hands of the wicked. You can count on it. If you love him and you give him pleasure, you can count on it. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. God paves that way. Rejoice in the Lord, ye righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. That's the song. That's the new song. In just a few verses into the next chapter, because it's a summons or, uh, for people to sing it, okay? What does he say about it? Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. And it continues on. And how beautiful it is. Take a home assignment. It's your summons, your personal summons to sing that song, to enjoy it, to know your Father is on the throne. You need to go to Him, talk to Him, let Him know most of all that you love Him. That's very important. Going, Returning to Revelation chapter 4 to complete this lecture, We pick it up following those that said, Holy, holy, which is, which was, and is to come. Verse 9. And when those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. Where is he? He's sitting on the throne. And worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying... What are they saying? Thou art, all crowns go to him. Okay, there's only one king of kings, Lord of lords. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You want to remember that verse. For his pleasure. He didn't create anything. You've got a lot of hybrids that come along the way of man's inventions. But what God created, he created for his pleasure, not man's. And when you sing that song, it makes that declaration. That's what it's all about. He's on the throne. That's where you reign from. Not only that, he fixed it, whereas priests shall reign with him for a thousand years through the millennium. And how precious it is that our Father makes all these things possible and how beautiful His Word is. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. You see, Lucifer stole the morning star because Christ is the morning star. But then, that's all right. He stole Christ, too, because he's Antichrist. So that's the way he operates. Um, Robert from California. I have a question I would like to know where in the Bible when God saw a 
whole bunch of bones over all the place, and he decided to turn them bones back into flesh. Thank you so much. Well, it, it really, he saw a lot of people that were spiritually dead, is the actual fact. And you're thinking about Ezekiel chapter 37. Okay. The, the point is, how, how, did, how did he bring them back to life, spiritually speaking? They were all very much alive. But what did he tell Ezekiel to do to them to give them life? To prophesy to them. That means preach to them. Teach them the truth. And if you will teach them the truth, they will accept God's Word. A little truth here and a little truth there and line on line. And they put it together and rightly dividing the Word of God until they become a living Christian soul serving Almighty God the house of, uh, of Israel, which was spread abroad, has a great re um, reflection in that 37th Psalm. In that 37th Psalm is when, even prophetically speaking, near the end, he's, he closes by saying, now that they're alive and know who they are, take two sticks, right on one Israel, the other Judah, and join them together. That means eternally we'll be back in the Father's house. Paula from Texas. Paula and Dusty from Texas. Uh, on September the 2nd, 09, our news, Houston, Texas, did interviews with the Bible company and was told that after 25 years, the Holy Bible is to be reworded. It will be replacing words like father with parent and men with people and will be non-gender. Question. How do we, as God's children, put a stop to this? Don't ever buy it. Let the thing sit in their barn till it rots. You don't need filth. These people that, well, you don't understand, brother, I'll be a scholar. Not if you change God's Word. You're not a scholar. You're a hypocrite. And when it comes to... Uh, why do people work for money? Okay. Well, how do we stop it? Don't buy it. That way they don't get the money and they get a lot of money tied up in it and let them drown in them. Okay. We don't need junk. And one of the main reasons that a lot of people might think, well, he's old-fashioned, he wants you to stick to that old King James, for the very simple reason that Dr. Strong and Dr. Smith Two of the better Christian scholars that ever lived okay, in, in the last 200 years um, put a fix on the manuscripts giving you, an English reader, the ability to see for yourself what the original word in the manuscript was, whether it was Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. That's why I insist you have those tools. But, dear one, that's, people like to try to change that. You don't know what a struggle we go through getting books printed that hold as best we can to the very truth, such as a Strong's Concordance. You can, you can buy a Strong's Concordance that is worthless. Okay. Or you can get one from us that pretty well holds it on the line. So that you don't have to take somebody's word for something. You have the word of God and the ability to look for yourself. What the word was in Hebrew, what its prime root was, where it came from, the various meanings it has so that you can make your own mind up which meaning applies to that particular verse. And that's why that... We put, try to put a stop, and that's why you'll hear me talk about certain uh, translations that uh, definitely, many might say, well, how do you know a Kenite changed it? Well, why, why would a Christian? It's obvious they're trying to hide the truth of the serpent seed. Who, who said that bad word? No, I, I didn't say it. It's biblical. If you've never read where the serpent has a seed, you've never read the third chapter of Genesis. I mean, you're, you're hurting. If you don't know how it started in the beginning, how are you ever going to figure out the end? 
whereby it very clearly states that um, the serpent's seed is, is, will bruise the head of the woman's seed, which is Christ. But the, Christ, the woman's seed will bruise, I'm sorry, will bruise the heel, the serpent's seed will bruise the heel of the woman's seed, Christ, but the woman's seed, Christ, will crush the head of the serpent's seed. That's Cain and his offspring, called Kenites, uh, throughout the Word. Why, why do they change it? Well, wouldn't you? You had the opportunity, and you got a lot of stupid followers that, well, you just print her and put her out there, and I, I'll go to church and just sit there and let them feed anything they want to to me. But I'm, I'm not going to check it out. Well, you're in a heap of hurt then, friend. Don't, if you're a spoon-fed Christian, I can tell you right now, you're probably not very intelligent in the Word of God. Well, are you talking down to people? Aren't you afraid you'll run some people off? I, I don't want that kind of people around me. I'm not hard up for students. Okay. I want people that think and want truth, not malarkey. Mark from California. Pastor Murray, in Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, on the sixth day creation, did God call their name Adam? And that's why when most people hear the name Adam, they um, uh, relate it to Adam and Eve in the garden. The, you know, you're, you're a lot nearer right than you might think. Okay. Because the word Adam many times is translated man because it means human. Okay. And human, uh, all of the races were human. God never created a race calling it human that was animal. Not so. They're all human and, um, and have souls, and God loves them. They're his children. Uh, he created them, and he looked, and it was good. So many people uh, try to make a racial thing out of the very truth of God's word when it explains the races, the, their dignity, their rights, and, uh, and certainly no one should find fault with that. Linda from Arizona, my question is, should one swear on the Bible? Well, it, it's, it, is, uh, it, it documents, number one, that you're a Christian, basically, or at least that you believe in the Word. And um, it, it is customary in this nation that our Constitution is formed from the Word of God to swear on that the word. To swear simply means to state that you're going to tell the truth. And there's nothing wrong with that. There are certain things I wouldn't want to, you know, the, the, that, that is not customary, but it is, it's a custom. And certainly... Um, in the first place, if you were to go before a jury and refuse to swear on God's word, there would be a lot in the jury you would turn against you coming out the gate. And there is no sin in swearing on the Bible that you're simply going to tell the truth, okay? Robin from California. What happened to all the souls before Jesus Christ? I know Jesus went back to them to save them, but what happened to them in the meantime? God bless you, Pastor Murray. You taught me a lot in 12 years. Well, thank you. The Word's good. Um, they're, they're in paradise. Okay. And, and they're happy there. Especially those that overcame. Those that did not overcome. I hope they're watching. They're, they're happy. They're not in any pain. And I hope they're watching events both on earth and in heaven. And watching our Father and listening, it is a time that they can learn. They can't change their state, but they can learn so that in the millennium, if they hadn't, if they never heard the truth, they will have an opportunity to, and they can gain a lot on it. They are happy. Dennis from Florida. My question is concerning the scripture, the dead shall rise first and the ones who are alive shall follow. Please explain what that means. It means just what it says. In the 13th verse, it says, if, Don't be ignorant like the heathens. If you believe Christ rose from after the dead, then 
you want to believe all those that are dead have already risen with him. Okay. Or you're not a Christian. They're not out here in some hole in the ground. The reason you can't perceive them is the word that's used is because they're already gone. Now, if you and I have two cars and we put them on a mark, and I give you a full day's head start, and you're way on down the road, then there's no way I can start before you because you're already gone. Okay. Well, that's exactly what it means, okay, is that um, those that uh, are already with the Father, there is no way we can perceive them because they're already out of here. They're with the Father. God is not the Father of the dead. They're not. God's children are not out here in a hole in the ground. He's got them around him. The good, the bad, and the ugly. As Christ described paradise, in Luke 16, so there's a gulf there where those that didn't make it can't cross, but they can still learn and observe. Rhonda from California, and I'm going to have to say Rhonda for tomorrow because I just got the sign. I am out of time. You know, I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but most important, God loves you for it. It's His letter. It's the letter He sent to you to show you how to find happiness and success in these flesh bodies, okay? And, and when, when you study it, it makes his day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours, all right? We're, we're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. But, hey, most important, you stay in his word. Listen good. You stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this? The same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular tapes. How, was the, what, how and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you've always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series.
the palm. Just plain old palm tree. You realize that the palm tree stands for victory and for peace. And its very shape is often mentioned in the Word of God as stately, has its little crown. But you know, the beauty of it is, if any tree is a type of the tree of life, there are about 300 uses for the, that nomads and other people use for the date palm. Each tree alone produces a good tree under normal conditions, will produce about 600 pounds of fruit. Within that fruit is protein, sugar, fiber, and it's just something that a nomad can just about live off that tree alone. Why? Well, the fiber, the leaves make the booth, 